Uh, Derek, hi from um, Grid Finance. You're very welcome. Hi, Peter. Great to be here. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Also, uh, Chris, Chris from uh, Spark Crowdfunding. Chris Bursch is here as well. G'day, Chris. Hi, guys. Um, if you're working from home, Chris, we probably should have uh, worked in the same office. We could have been together. Um, uh, no mask necessary. Uh, and uh, g'day to Colin. Colin is joining us from Flender. Colin, again, thanks um, uh, for your time being here today. And uh, each of you are going to do your own presentation. Um, um, and I will kick things off sort of by going through an opening um, presentation now. Forgive me if I do look across at the screens. I'm just keeping an eye on um, uh, what the slides are. So I'll just start sharing screen with the audience. And a few of you that were uh, diligent and got here at one o'clock would have seen one slide um, up there already. And um, I will just go back to that slide in a few seconds. Um, we go. So, gents, for the moment, you might just go on to uh, mute or just turn your cameras off, and I will go through this uh, presentation. Um, forgive me here, I'm just trying to speed that up. Uh, can, hopefully, you can see the presentation. Uh, yes, all good, Peter. Uh, thanks for that. And every so often, you may hear Chris, Derek, or Colin jump in just to confirm that the presentation showing. So look, I just did a quick introduction there for Derek, Chris and Colin. Um, we're looking at project crowdfunding, we called it, as a new regulated industry for Ireland, opportunities and challenges. And of course, this is against uh, the backdrop of the new EU regulation and the Central Bank Consultation 141. Um, now, we're not going to duplicate efforts here today in terms of who says what, so I'm going to get through this very quickly. The slide presentation for today's session will be available on fintechisland.com on the events page. Simply scroll down to today's event for the 27th of April and you'll find these slides there. Now, they're not uploaded just at the moment. They will go up after the session. Um, and uh, subject to my um, uh, speakers agreeing to it, we'll put up um, a copy of the video. We may, need to, we may edit it down somewhat to make it easier to watch. In terms of agenda and presenters and the audience, um, we'll go into that next. Um, if you like tweeting, well, we're going to use crowdfunding as the hashtag for this and feel free to tweet at uh, Fintech Island and we'll get those uh, retweeted during the course of the event. Um, now, in terms of the agenda, I'll take the first 10 minutes and then we'll go into a series of presentations from our subject matter experts, Derek, Chris and Colin. Um, then we'll go into a 20-minute Q&A panel discussion, which I'll moderate with the gentleman, and then we'll go into um, a roundtable. Now, what I would like to ask just at the moment is um, i just like to ask a question about who's going to stick around uh, for the um, uh, uh, roundtable, um, and I'm just going to launch that now in the background. So that will help us figure out how much time we will need um, for that session, which starts at two o'clock. So if you are sticking around, please do complete the poll. That's going to be very useful to me uh, to, under, to, to manage the day. In our audience today, um, no surprise, we have crowdfunding uh, folk. We also have fintech and regtech from other industries. And of course, we have others that aren't involved in either fintech or regtech or crowdfunding. So the percentage split, 25% come from crowdfunding. That's out of a registered total of 107 people. And also 23% come from fintech or, and regtech. So not in crowdfunding, but in that innovative circle. Um, and also the others, 52%. In terms of others, you come from financial institutions, government agencies, professional services firms like lawyers and accountants, compliance and regulatory professionals, IT. Uh, service companies, recruitment, and tech hubs, and we have banks, insurers, MIFID. That's always interesting, I guess, because uh, a lot of crowdfunding, MIFID regulation, so they're, they're on the line as well. You're more than welcome. Um, just jumping to the next slide, just in terms of the network, you've probably seen this slide before, so we won't really jump into it, but um, if you're not a subscriber to the FinTech Island Network, I'd suggest maybe you get on board because you guys get priority if you subscribe to our events. Pretty happy that we have 2,500 people that have either opted in or are on the list because they've been to an event, and every email we send includes the unsubscribe link. Um, um, just a shameless plug for an event that we're going to do on Thursday, the 6th of May. That's actually up already, and the reason we're putting this one up just here is because on the 8th of April, we run the event 
on getting authorised as an e-money firm or a payment services firm, and we put in about virtual asset service providers. And indeed, actually, that's sort of relevant to crowdfunding in some respects. Um, but um, uh, given the launch of the um, legislation in that area on Friday last week, we're now going to host a special event on that. So that's up and running on Eventbrite and our website, which you can you can look at. Now, in terms of the survey uh, that we're doing at the moment, I just want to point out two things from the FinTech Island survey. Firstly, that is debt funding and, and um, equity uh, funding uh, considered by those who do our um, survey have said 270 plus respondents as being key challenges. Equity crowd for equity funding is being that uh, uh, seem to be a bigger challenge than the, the debt funding. And also, interestingly, I'm sure some of the panel members may have a view on this is that 27% uh, uh, of the people who have done the survey have said that government support um, is a challenge. Um, do do the survey because if you want to join one of these FinTech Island maps and you'll see some of the crowdfunding firms there under credit and lending, um, you need to do the survey. Um, and that's the same for the international firms. And we're hoping that what we'll eventually do is we'll create a new map for all those crowdfunding firms that do seek authorization in Ireland, and that will join this sort of regulated map as well. So <clears throat> just briefly, crowdfunding market require marketing requirements. Um, they're in consultation paper 141. Um, you really do need to read that um, document, and I suggest read through the regulation as well. The consultation closes on the 13th of July. Central Bank will be the designated competent authority, and that's why they're empowered to publish national marketing requirements. So what's the outcome of all this? Well, in terms of marketing outcomes, it's around consumer protection. And I've used the umbrella in this because crowdfunding service providers will fall under the consumer protection code that will be caught by that umbrella, um, along with other regulated financial services providers. I might go through some of these slides relatively quickly because we'll pick up on these again during the roundtable. But I think what's important to point out at this point, at this stage, is that in terms of marketing outcomes, they must be fair, clear, and not misleading, and be consistent with the information in the key investment sheet, or what we call is the KISS. And they must be clearly identifiable as marketing communications, and they must ensure that marketing communications, the CSPs, that is, the crowdfunding service providers, do not disproportionately uh, encourage investment in one crowdfunding project over others. So how, that's the what. So what's the how? Well, it's going to be done by amendments to the Consumer Protection Code. And why? Well, well, the outcome is that Irish consumers will now or soon will receive the same protection as regards advertising communications they receive from crowdfunding service providers as they do from other financial service providers such as banks, insurance companies and intermediaries and so on. Now, these slides are a little bit ugly and the detail is here, so I won't stop and go through them in immense detail. But look. Under the code, you start really at chapter nine, and I call it code 9.1, which actually means code provision 9.1. That's the unofficial uh, consolidation of the Consumer Protection Code image I'm using there, um, and the actual code will be amended by section 117 of the Central Bank Act. But again, there's going to be a need for a regulatory disclosure statement. Uh, the CSPs are going to have to ensure that the advertisement's design, presentation and content is clear, it's fair, it's accurate and it's not misleading. So terms that we're probably all familiar with and does not influence a consumer's attitude to the advertised product by ambiguity, exaggeration or omission. And we must ensure that the advertisement is designed so it can be reasonably understood to be an advertisement. That one's really important. Um, so the name will need to be shown together with the key information. Now, there is a very big warning uh, um, statement the central bank will ask for in what's called the KISS document. But there is actually other um, uh, uh, abbreviated forms that will go into advertising. Now, we need to ensure the warning statements meet the certain criteria um, in the crowdfunding marketing requirements. And so 
uh, warnings aren't required if the advertisement does not refer to the benefit of a product or a service, but only the names of the product or the service or an invite to a consumer to discuss the product or the service. So that's fairly interesting to have a look at. Um, just conscious of time here, I'm going to run over by about five minutes on my presentation, but I will make up the time in the Q&A because some of these points just need to get out in order for the Q&A session. But um, crowdfunding service providers, but they're subject to specific requirements to ensure that any recommendation or commendation quoted within an advertisement is fair. So you've got to get the consent of the author if we're going to be using an author. Um, we have to state if the author is, and I've got this in italics, in any way connected or has received a reward in relation to the recommendation or commendation. And if using comparisons and contrasts in advertisements, it must be done in such a way to use those that are verified facts or use reasonable assumptions and be presented in, a, again, that clear and fair and balanced way and not omit anything material. And we need to ensure that the advertisement, um, if it contains acronyms, state what those letters stand for. So um, probably things that a lot of folk are, are sort of quite familiar with. There are other specific requirements around the impact of taxation and also a statement promise or forecast, whether it's contained in the advertisement code 9.11. And also if there's any promotional or introductory interest rates. I won't stop on each of these points because we'll come back to these in the round table. As I look at the, um, uh, the, um, the poll that's still in progress, um, it looks like about 20 to 30 people are going to stick around for the uh, uh, for the round table. Um, and we'll go into this in much more detail. There are other specific details in the proposals um, as well. And um, as I mentioned earlier, is the proposed warning statement. Now, this is the warning statement that goes into the key information, uh, or what we call the KISS. I just call it that for, for short, actually, from now on, but the KISS. Um, and we've got to point out that the deposit guarantee scheme and the investment um, uh, compensation schemes aren't applicable to crowdfunding um, ventures. And also, I've got in the red box, you may not receive any return on your investment. This is not a savings product, and we advise you not to invest more than 10%. So that's the proposed warning statement. So that's what the industry needs to have a think about, whether it's happy or not with that, including you may not be able to sell the investment instruments when and if you wish. Um, so I'm just going to end the polling for the first poll and just briefly say uh, when I share that now on the screen, uh, you will see that those figures. Uh, so we've got about 20 um, uh, uh, folk will stick around for the event after two o'clock. There are two warnings that are being proposed in advertisements. Options A is warning investment in crowdfunding projects entails risk, including the risk of a partial or entire loss of the money investment. And option B is a slightly wordier one. Warning, investment in crowdfunding projects entails risk, including the risk of partial or entire loss of the money investment. And your investment is not covered by a deposit guarantee scheme or by an investor compensation scheme. Now, just at the moment, I think what I'd like to do is I'm just gonna put that poll out there and just see what the audience thinks on, um, on, that, on that question. Um, option A, do you agree it should be option A or do you think it should be option B? And this poll that I'm putting up there is actually a yes or no. There's no other option, like I have no view. Other polls we'll do during the course of the hour, we'll have that up there. Um, so at the moment, just looking for those, I'll let those go through because the question is in the poll as well. Um, again, we're all around clear and consistent presentation of information and ensuring that, you know, the intended outcome is that consumers receive an equivalent level of protection in relation to marketing communications for crowdfunding as are in place for other firms, other regulated financial services providers. And also that consumers will understand the risk of potential loss of some or all of their money invested in relation to their crowdfunding investments. Now, I'm going to stop there because the next series of slides will really come out in relation to the roundtable. So I would left the poll open at the moment. It's been going for a minute and 13 seconds. I've finished um, my current presentation. 
Um, and at the moment, we're looking at 71% went for option A, which um, uh, and uh, option B received 29% uh, of the votes. Um, and I'll come back to that um, in due course. So, gentlemen, I went through a presentation relatively quickly just to discuss uh, what's in that code. Your discussions are going to be really who you are, what you do. Derek, do join. Paul, please. Yep, I'll tell you pop up. Please do join in. Um, Derek's going to set the ecosystem of crowdfunding for us, talk about um, some thoughts around uh, the regulation on his business um, and, uh, and anything else that crosses his mind before we'll jump into the um, panel discussion. So, Derek, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and, sir, it is over to you. Thanks, uh, Peter. Um, and I'll just, uh, I'll just bring this up on screen here now. While you're doing that, I've just shared the poll results with the audience. So 71% option A and 29% uh, option B. And I'm going to stop sharing so Derek can take over. Over to you, Derek. I'm going on mute. Okay. Perfect. I uh, just was making sure I'm off. Um, I'm off mute there. Um, okay, great to be here, uh, Peter, and uh, to be with Chris and uh, Colin. Um, I suppose to, before I just kick off on some very high level slides on the the space. You know, I, I think the key one of the key things for me is we've been waiting a long time for this. Um, you know, crowdfunding was really birthed after the last crisis. Um, as a new way of uh, funding individuals, businesses, charities. Um, it was the, the, the original design of the sort of crowdfunding or peer-to-peer -peer lending model dates right back to 2005 with uh, Zopa in the UK. Um, so this has been around for quite a while. Um, I think it can. it's fair to say that everybody in the space uh, would, would agree that the that the size of the space is smaller than it than would have been expected uh, at this point, uh, and that's partly correlated with the lack of a regulatory uh, regime. Uh, you can see the commensurate success of the crowdfunding and particularly the peer-to-peer -peer lending sector in the UK uh, after the UK government really roundly embraced uh, the space um, after the last crisis and put in a very specific, well-designed regulatory framework. Um, which included a sandbox uh, environment in the FCA. So it works to uh, standardize uh, rules and technical requirements in a new space like this uh, because it helps grow the space. And one of the big things that we're looking towards is, you know, how much does it grow the space? Um, and, you know, is are we going to see hockey stick growth or will it uh, continue to be, you know, a solid sort of double digit growth on an annual basis. Nobody has the answer to that question, um, but we'll hopefully find out over the next few years. Um, so just for the audience, just to refresh uh, the different types of crowdfunding, and um, for those who are practitioners, it's uh, uh, you know well known. Uh, really four different pillars. Um, you have a community or non-return based uh, crowdfunding. And then you have financial return, uh, uh, crowdfunding that Grid Finance um, and uh, Spark um, are in, uh, and Flender. Um, the uh, community crowdfunding includes the likes of Kickstarter, uh, which are reward-based. Um, crucially, this new regulatory regime does not cover and has no intention of covering the community-based uh, or, or donation-based crowdfunding or reward-based crowdfunding uh, platforms. Uh, you have the likes of GoFundMe who are within that uh, cohort as well. So they all stay outside of this uh, regulatory uh, umbrella. Um, equity crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer lending are, are covered um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the regime uh, speaks very clearly to uh, how platforms and firms comply. Um, of those two, you know, peer-to-peer -peer has certainly been the most successful on this side of the pond, um, whereas in the US, I think it's fair to say that equity crowdfunding has been more 
uh, successful. Um, you know, one of the big things uh, here uh, from a regulatory perspective will be the uh, uh, denoting of investors as either sophisticated or unsophisticated investors. Um, I know on our platform, we apply a suitability test to everybody that lands and joins our uh, lending community, um, but there would be enhanced uh, criteria for unsophisticated investors in particular. Um, just a little bit more detail then on, on what, in, in this example, a peer-to-peer -peer <clears throat> lending platform operates. Um, you know, the platform is uh, an intermediary. Um, at, at the end of the day, that's what they are. They are simply connecting uh, those who have capital uh, with those uh, who need it. Um, and they charge a fee um, along the way. Um, in some cases, it can make the money uh, significantly more expensive than the bank. And you know, again, part of the um, uh, part of the uh, sort of interest in the next few years to will be to see how this sits alongside sort of bank financing. Um, will it replace it? I don't think so. Um, but it certainly has the capacity to complement. Um, a lot of small businesses that uh, can't access finance with the banks um, or can access it, but wants faster and easier to access funding. Um, but I don't envision at any stage in the next decade that uh, crowdfunding platforms will be able to provide uh, funding uh, as cheaply as the banks. Um, and that's no bad thing. You know, there is an obsession in certainly in this jurisdiction around uh, credit pricing and no focus at all on accessibility and uh, absolutely fantastic to be able to access lending um, with a central bank government uh, subsidized bank at three or four percent if you can get access to it and the reality is there's massive cohorts of the economy and, and the small business sector in particular that can't get access to funding um, so th this um, uh, graph speaks to the role of the platform. It's to really originate the loan opportunity, uh, to fund it from its pool of lenders, uh, to credit check it, and then to administer uh, to administer uh, that loan over the lifetime of that loan, or if it's an equity investment, um, to be the sort of fiduciary holder of that equity security uh, uh, until there's some form of liquidity event. Um, so. Uh, so that hopefully gives a little bit of insight into uh, how a platform works at a very practical level. So European crowdfunding, as I said, there's been um, a long wait for this uh, piece of regulation. You know, we would have advocated very heavily um, since we were founded um, over eight years ago for a regulatory regime akin to what is in the UK. Um, and, you know, the, the very clear response was, uh, you know, from Department of Finance is that we have to wait for European regulation and that there was no basis to have a, an intermediary um, uh, sort of regulatory regime. So it's, it's been a while coming. It's, it's great to have it. Um, at the moment, the, the size of the European uh, crowdfunding market is about 20 billion. Um, but of that 20 billion, the UK uh, represents at least half of that. Um, and uh, so, so it, it demonstrates just the sheer, in my mind at least, the sheer size of the opportunity in the UK, or sorry, in, 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 in Europe, given that the, um, the, the post-Brexit European economy still ranks seven, seven and a half times bigger than the UK one. Um, so there, there remains a very nascent and a very significant opportunity in European crowdfunding. Uh, with this uh, regulatory framework now standardizing the rules and the approach across all um, uh, EU 27 uh, nations. Um, I mentioned a couple of times now that, you know, we've waited a long time for this regulation and um, that in, in that intervening period, a lot of uh, firms have either exited the space um, or they've evolved their models. And if you look at the really big platforms that have gotten scale, uh, particularly the likes of Funding Circle, you know, they're all quasi-bank. Uh, Zopa, who was the original designer of this model, um, are, are moving now to become a fully-fledged regulated credit institution and a bank. Um, I still see great space for uh, platforms like ourselves 
that have no intention of becoming a bank, but want to fill that gap and that void in small uh, business financing. Um, so it will, it, you know, when the dust settles over the next 12, 18 months and uh, authorizations are issued, it will be really interesting to see who's who becomes a fully fledged um, authorized um, crowdfunder. Um, and it may be less than we think, because as I say, a number of the firms that would have been very successful post the last crisis um, have now gone different directions, either with an evolved model, which is, you know, uh, an ICAV type funding model um, or uh, becoming a fully fledged bank. So um, the space is definitely smaller than we would have anticipated. And that's partly because some uh, firms have moved in new directions. And, and just, I think it, it's a really big open question, what will be the size of this space in uh, 2030? Um, so just to wrap up then, uh, you know, the regulation covers lending and equity only. Uh, it's really focused on uh, lender protection and there is no um, umbrella, regulatory umbrella for the borrowing activity. So SME lending remains an unregulated activity, which makes sense, uh, certainly from our perspective. Um, platforms must be uh, independent. And I think that's a really strong theme um, in uh, the regulation that the platform is an independent intermediary between capital holders and capital receivers. And uh, I think uh, some platforms, as I mentioned, have evolved their model to be quasi participators in some loans. Um, that is not the spirit of these regulations. So it'll be interesting to see which uh, European platforms uh, steer back towards a fully fledged intermediary model um, and and lastly the deadline is November 2021 um, this has to happen uh, it's not a directive uh, it is uh, they are regulations passed by the European Union um, so uh, both ESMA and CBI um, have to make this happen by then so it's going to be very interesting uh, sort of 12 months as lots of firms like ourselves sort of grapple um, to become authorized by that date. So hopefully that gives everybody a little bit of a flavor. I'll just um, stop sharing um, of the overall landscape. Um, and I'm happy to, I think, pass over now to Chris. Perfect. So thanks very much, Derek. Uh, Chris is going to join. Um, uh, uh, thanks for the presentation. Thanks for those slides. Uh, some very interesting points there, particularly around your thoughts uh, on the intermediary between the capital holders and the capital receivers. Um, so I didn't actually do justice to Derek when I, I introduced him. I have known Derek for many, many years and uh, as, as, I've, as I've known Chris as well. Um, and they really are part of this fintech community where they are great to have a conversation with. So um, uh, I'm, I want to say thank you, Derek, because you've been very supportive of the things that we have been doing over the years. Hopefully um, we've been supportive of what you've been doing at Grid and uh, Chris for you. And I'll be saying the same to Colin when he comes on board. Uh, Chris, um, your CEO and, uh, and co-founder of uh, CrowdSpark, Crowd, sorry, Spark Crowdfunding. Excuse me, uh, it's been a long morning. Um, so, sir, I, I over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, yes, absolutely. And uh, thanks very much for uh, having us uh, on today. So uh, I've got a few slides as well. Um, uh, just a quick intro to who we are and who I am. Chris Burge, um, uh, as, uh, as Peter said, uh, CEO and co-founder of uh, Spark Crowdfunding. We've been around now for the last uh, three years. We were incorporated in May in uh, May uh, 2018. So yeah, three, uh, three year anniversary is, is coming around the corner. Uh, and in that time, we've um, helped uh, 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 kind of a number of businesses, uh, over 20 businesses now have uh, come onto our platform and, and have raised funds with us. Uh, and we're very happy to have uh, helped those along. And um, as, uh, as Derek was saying, we are the equity side of, uh, of crowdfunding here in Ireland. We're the only ones at the moment, but I, I'm sure because of the passporting uh, function that the uh, the regulations bring in, that will mean that uh, you know other other businesses from around uh, the uh, the other parts of Europe will will perhaps move into Ireland as well. And, uh, and it's really to be uh, encouraged and expected as well, really. And it will make uh, the, the industry, hopefully, uh, that little bit more um, robust uh, and, and get more players into it and, and, and make us more competitive for, for the investors and investees that, uh, that we help as well. 
Um, I've got a few slides that will talk about what equity crowdfunding is and you know, what, it, what it's about and, and how we uh, are, uh, you know, and what we do in the country. So we, we think of us as a dragon's, lion, a dragon's den online, or, or, or in other words, another uh, an analogy is uh, HBAN with more investors. Investors that probably invest smaller amounts, or or some of them at least, anyway. But nevertheless, it's the same same principle uh, where we have a a, a group of uh, of people uh, merged together to to help put uh, equity uh, and funding into into small businesses. So what we do, we we're, we're purely a platform that just uh, connects the two, uh, very similar to uh, the uh, the way that Derek was describing uh, uh, Grid as well, where we just connect investors and high growth companies and and we are the facilitators in between and, and we, we divert the money from one uh, into the other. So we like to think that we democratize the investment opportunities that mean everybody can, can raise money and anyone can invest. Normally before crowdfunding was uh, was around, you, you really had to be a, a, a VC or a small private equity uh, house or, or a family office that, that would actually invest very large or medium to large uh, amounts of money into these startup businesses. Because heretofore it was very difficult for a, 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 a small investment to go into these because the, the legal fees were just far too great to actually facilitate it. You'd be spending more in legal fees than you would be actually investing. So so we facilitate the, 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 the movement of money from, from uh, lots of small uh, pots into, into the businesses. So, as I said, uh, we're Dragon's Line on Den. We create shares for that funding that goes uh, from, uh, from the investor to the investee. And we're just simply a marketplace for those investors that are seeking investment. So the, the mechanism of how it works is very straightforward. Um, the, the companies would apply to the platform. We would create a campaign. We then launch it to the world, of course, and, and, and we promote it as widely as possible. At the end, if they've reached the target amount, uh, we close, we get on with the legal work and ultimately release the funds. And it, it's really as simple as that. And, you know, we, we've created a, a mechanism that, that is very straightforward and very uh, easy for everybody to, 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 to get hold of. As I said, it democratizes the investment. So it's not just limited to the large uh, uh, angel syndicates or VCs. Anybody can get in um, uh, at the ground floor uh, uh, of, uh, of the business's inception. So meaning friends, family, and, and obviously the general context that, you, that, that the people have uh, can invest into those, uh, into those businesses without the expense of those professional fees. So there's a funding gap that, that exists and we, we think that we kind of fill that void uh, between the microfinance and the professional institutional money that uh, is there. The banks have, uh, have uh, although they, 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 they say that they are meeting a lot of these SME funding requirements, just aren't able to or even capable to at the moment. And so, so uh, and of course, if you're a professional institutional, the, the, a lot, particularly in the last 12 or so months uh, since COVID has been around, they've been protecting a lot of their own investments in their own portfolios to make sure, um, for, for good reason, that make sure that those businesses don't, didn't fail. So, so that meant that there was, in the, particularly in the last, uh, you know 14 15 months that there was this gap and you know and and we'd like to think that uh, yeah, spark has been a, a around to actually fill fill of that uh, fill el uh, elements of that as well so the success factors it, when you're when you're raising money and what what an investor can expect of the uh, of the business as well it needs to have a strong founding team it needs to be you know very uh, rich of uh, of ip as well um it needs to be scalable. There needs to be a plan to have that exit because of the, otherwise the, the money is still locked into that business. And that's not what an investor is looking for. Investors are obviously looking to actually get an exit within the three or five year window when they're inv investing in, in an equity uh, uh, through equity crowdfunding. The, the, the companies I, I've put in there, they need to be in revenue, but it's not always the case. We've, we've funded a number of companies that haven't been in revenue, but nevertheless, it certainly helps when uh, trying to persuade an investor to part with their, with their hard-earned money. Um, the businesses need to have th their own good network, of course, just to stimulate the investment uh, as well uh, as going out to, to our, our cohort of, uh, of investors that are on our database. 
but the but uh, you know one of the the key elements is that the the business needs to be investable uh, and as these people will see that the campaigns they need to be going yeah i can see myself investing in that and i'm happy to do so these are just some of the campaigns that we've run over the last uh, over the last three years um you know some are as little as you know just over a hundred thousand that is our our lower limit now uh, but we've recently raised uh, 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 1.2 million for a, a cure genomics which is a spin out uh, uh, based in ucd uh, based in nova ucd um and uh, and they they've uh, they've recently closed their campaign with us uh, not so while not so long ago Wanted to share with you just a quick case study as well as to show you, you know, what uh, what we what we've done in the past as well. Moby Bikes uh, had a campaign with us just before Christmas last year. Uh, they they had a target of three hundred thousand, which we 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 surpassed just within four days of the campaign going live, which was a great uh, which was a great start to the to the campaign. Of course, they ultimately went on to raise almost eight hundred thousand, uh, and obviously were overfunded by two hundred sixty five percent. Uh, there were 277 investors that came in um uh, the the maximum investment single investment was 75000 uh, euros into the business the average investment was uh, almost 3000 euros and that's probably a little higher than we would normally expect on normal uh, average investments just over 2 2200 2300 uh, euros uh, and they had a pre money valuation of 5 and a half million uh, and uh, so, yeah, so Moby went on and, and, uh, and, and uh, as now you will see a lot of their bikes around town, which they've done. So a quick slide on regulation, um, as uh, and a lot of this is, uh, uh, Derek has already kind of painted the picture, so I won't go into this in too much more detail. But of course, it's a common set of rules across the EU. Uh, the crowdfund CSP stands for crowd uh, funding service providers. So we're able to passport across borders now. Obviously, that's a bit of a double edged sword. Uh, it means that we've got export opportunities now into other jurisdictions throughout Europe. Uh, but uh, of course, there are others that will probably come into Ireland as well and uh, and uh, and start uh, providing a service here as well, which, as I say, is, is totally uh, expected and uh, and understandable. And hopefully, as I say, will will make the market just that little bit more keen for everybody, uh, both for investors and for investees as well. Obviously, there's going to be an extra overhead uh, to meet that regulation requirement, and uh, we're, we're, we're very much expecting that to, to be the case and are ready for that as well. And uh, yeah, it really will be a, 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 a welcome addition to, to, the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the sector, to the business. Um, as as uh, Derek said, yeah, we were, we were very much expecting this to come along. We knew that it was going to arrive uh, and, it was, and it's, uh, it's great that we were actually having uh, that, that in place now and uh, we're looking forward to actually getting, getting our teeth into it. So just a bit about crowdfunding as to why you'd actually do it. So for an investee, uh, it's very simple and quick and, and low cost as well. Uh, you get a lot of free uh, uh, media exposure with it as well. And you build up that loyal tribe of supporters who will hopefully go on to invest further as well as you go on to do a, another round. For an investor, it's also very simple and quick. There's zero cost as an investor. There's no money that's, uh, there's no money that's charged to the investor. Um, they, in fact, they actually get a, a, a very nice tax relief when you actually do an equity investment. They get you get forty percent re tax relief for, uh, through EIS, which is a, it, uh, which is a revenue or government in, initiative uh, 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 overseen by the revenue commissioners. There's also no upside cap on uh, investing uh, in, in the equity business. So, you know, if the company goes on to be a the the well sought after uh, unicorn then you you will get that uplift in in your investment as well with that and of course you're supporting young irish businesses and, and giving them the the leg up that they require in order to get out into the to the big bad world as well and and, uh, and create their businesses and grow those so uh, so there are my slides guys and I'm, I'm looking forward to the uh, questions uh, when uh, they come along and uh, we'll talk about some regulation in a bit more detail at that point thanks very much Hey, thank you very much for that, Chris. Um, you've made me think about a number of questions, both for you and actually for Derek, when we go to the, the Q&A. And um, I just wanted to uh, quickly say, um, uh, one of the questions I'm going to have, and I might just give both, you know, give Colin, you, and Derek a heads up. I, I, I do want to ask um, a question, not for our answer now, but one of the ones will be about the ability of pension funds and people who have pensions to get exposure 
with this area, particularly they really want to participate in, in helping reboot small to medium-sized enterprises and other Irish companies. So, Chris, thanks very much for that. Um, I'm just going to turn now and start introducing Colin. Colin, before I do, I just think it's important that I give a bit of a shout-out to some folk that are on the call today, not mentioning any names. Um, but in addition to Ireland, we have people on the call uh, dialing in from Pakistan, um, the UK, as you'd expect. Um, we have them from Argentina, uh, the United States, Germany, the United um, Arab Emirates, um, Spain, and Morocco. Uh, but in particular, a shout out to the folk from Australia, uh, given my accent, that are up at some unearthly hour um, near midnight down there that are tuning in to listen to you guys. So, Colin, um, no pressure. Colin, you're head of uh, originations at Blender. And so over to you. Thanks, Peter. And thanks to Chris and Derek. Uh, really interesting uh, presentation there. So, yeah, first things first, look at the Flinder. Delighted to be part of this uh, discussion round table. Um, I think to set the scene, look, we would welcome, you know, a regulation, especially in the area of marketing uh, that's coming up in the next few months and indeed across the whole industry uh, for, for a, I suppose, a range of, of measures and, and needs. And uh, look, at, I, I just said I'd, I'd put that out there. So look, um, just to introduce myself, um, as I said, just a quick pitch. I joined Flinder in 2018, primarily. First things first, uh, it was in the role of Head of Partnerships and then I moved into Head of Originations last January. Um, so we merged our partnership and intermediary channel uh, in January 2020. And, you know, our focus is on, you know, a personalised uh, lending offering with uh, obviously matching our best in class uh, financial technology. Uh, previous Flinder, I was in Bluestone, uh, Hayes and AIB and uh, that was primarily across credit, business development and sales um, over that time. And uh, just, uh, I'm an active GA rugby man and uh, for my sins, I'm a United supporter and uh, my claim to fame is that I won an All-Ireland minor with Roscommon and yes, I was an escort in the Rose of Tralee. So moving swiftly on, uh, so there's a bit of background on myself. Um, so yeah, so I suppose a little bit more about Flinder, more, more importantly, um, Flinder was set up in 2015, uh, uh, commenced lending in 2017. Um, so we actually went through, uh, I suppose, a raise through Cedars platform based in the UK. And uh, we raised just over half a million sterling um, to actually establish the business back in, in 2015. Uh, the company became uh, FCA approved in, in, in late uh, 2016, early 2017. And the focus was initially to actually commence as a social lending platform, which was looking at the whole area of startups and uh, people that had social circles that we're looking to, I suppose, commence uh, businesses. Uh, unfortunately, you know, I suppose, you know, lending to startups, especially in an unsecured nature as we do, was, was extremely tough. And, uh, you know, we, we quickly realized that to scale the business, we needed to, I suppose, implement a more, I suppose, uh, stringent credit policy into the business. So we transitioned into a mix of uh, crowdfunding and institutional lending late in 2018 with the onboarding of a senior institutional lender. Um, so we did adopt uh, a more strict credit policy um, and uh, with higher ticket sizes. Uh, our focus, of, of, of course, like, like all the other uh, speakers, is to assist SMEs with a faster access to working capital and cash flow, um, where, you know, perhaps some of the banks uh, have exited in, in recent weeks and months. Um, you know, we, we, we anticipate a big opportunity there for us over the next while. Um, but also we want to merge that with the uh, lending opportunities via our crowdfunding platform as well to consumers. And that's why, obviously, this regulation in the, in the uh, uh, consumer sector segment is, is very important. Um, but the focus is to try and become a, a leading uh, SME lender. Uh, we have a, a really exciting strategic partnership that we hope to launch later this year, uh, which will hopefully make us a household name. And then our aim is to you know, grow locally and then into uh, continental Europe, hopefully into uh, 2022 and 2023. Um, so I suppose, um, you know, in terms of um, uh, Flinder itself, uh, I've just skipped a slide there actually, sorry about this. Uh, yeah, so uh, in terms of Flinder ourselves, you know, our focus is, is, is 
I suppose, in helping SMEs across Ireland. And, um, you know, as you can appreciate, you know, we do offer investment opportunities on our retail marketplace. Um, I think, uh, you know, key topic, um, you know, that I was happy to discuss today, Peter, was the whole area of financial literacy across the area of crowdfunding. And I think, you know, we actually undertook a, a, an internal uh, research piece recently that found, you know, like uh, that a high proportion of our investors are actually in the in the late teens and early 20s categories. Um, so a demographic is quite young. Um, and, you know, I suppose literacy in that space of, 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 I suppose, the whole investment area, you know, for us, we feel is, is an area that probably needs some, uh, you know, education around that. Um, so, you know, you know, what we encourage is, you know, and what we will be encouraging is, you know, if people are looking to become investors on the Flender platform, you know, to really, you know, specifically understand who they're investing in, what areas they're investing in, what are the macro fa economic factors with investing in a company of that of that sector of that scale, and um, you know what element of risk do they want to actually proportion, um, you know, to to their investment piece. So obviously we adopt a price to risk philosophy. So you know naturally enough, the higher the interest rate, the higher the risk. So you know part of obviously the marketing communications and regulation would be probably to emphasise the risk associated with you know, higher interest rate interest rate loans. Um, and you know as you can see here, you know we have a blend of you know in the in the low eights uh, up into the into the you know high to, to low teens um so naturally enough we're trying to add evidence and, and show and educate people that you know that there is a there is a range of investment opportunities there um so you know it, it, it boils down to knowing your customer um doing your due diligence knowing the sector you're looking to get involved in um you know how long you actually wish to invest for uh, and what element of, of, of risk uh, you want to proportion your money to because you know as i said you know all your capital you know it can be at risk unless you diversify accordingly so you know as a whole you know we want to improve the uh, financial lit literacy of crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer across ireland over the coming months ahead and uh, you know as a whole you know flinder would welcome the uh, the introduction of this regulatory piece and indeed uh, across the whole you know the whole uh, crowdfunding sector going going forward um, in terms of case study, um, so Richard Leeson of Highbold, um, good example, you know, uh, a really strong business base in Tipperary, came to us looking for a quarter of a million to, to use as cash flow for his business, was importing from China, um, obviously pre-pandemic, and obviously once the pandemic hit our shores, you know, there was an issue regarding supply chain, and uh, obviously invoices were, were obviously uh, being extended in terms of days past due, so um, we were happy that within 72 hours we were able to turn that around and uh, actually assist his business for cash flow purposes so you know primarily Flinder focuses on cash generative Irish SMEs that are looking for an alternative to that of the banks or other players in the marketplace so you know um, you know it is our you know feeling that there's a huge opportunity there to take advantage of where you know we don't sell them price or we don't sell on rate we sell on you know the value of you know speed efficiency and uh, the whole relationship piece so you know i think you know moving forward um you know we, we are hopeful that you know in the, in the post pandemic world and um, that there will be serious opportunity for our services because of our, our financial technology um, then I suppose just to summarise, you know, again getting behind the the Irish SME sector, we will be launching Project Green. Um, so we'd ask people to stay tuned with this over the coming days and, and weeks ahead. Um, so focus is on trying to assist and, and help reboot Irish SMEs with you know those efficiencies of speed, um, you know, and, and transactional ability, um, you know, ahead of the banks and po po possibly other incumbents in the market. So we are hopeful um, that that project will will assist many SMEs in a post-COVID environment but uh, so as I said that will be launching in the next coming uh, couple of weeks there. So look at thanks for listening uh, I kept it short and, and sweet uh, happy to answer any questions at the end about Flinder or indeed uh, anything to do with the platform so look at thanks again for the time and the opportunity. Hi hey, Colin thank you very much for that um, you know what we actually missed a trick it had, had I known that you were an escort and the Rose of Truly, that's what the event would have been about. So um, uh, I'm hoping lots of folk are going to ask you lots of questions about that particular experience. Um, I'm going to log off now. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> um, Derek, uh, feel free to join in with us now. Um, the um, We don't have that. Actually, we've, we've got a couple of questions which are coming via chat. And I have a few questions from, the, from myself. And also, actually, after putting out the call to arms for the chat, there's a couple of questions coming in. Um, uh, so I, I'll start with the one that came in via the chat. 
And I will just need to open that again so I have it in front of me. Um, and uh, oh, I've, I, I may have may have lost it in here, but um, here we go. Um, it was it's from um, Mark Bonham, and um, Mark asked, um, "What are the panelists' views on equity sales in crowdfunding? It's easy to invest, but the same platforms." Um, don't appear to have a clear framework on sales. Any views on whether there is a clear framework on sales? And I guess, is this uh, consultation paper going to help? Or if you disagree with, you know, sorry, not disagree with Mark, but if you've got another view, um, feel free to jump in. But I'll just repeat that because I may have confused you by talking too much. What are the panelists' views on equity sales in crowdfunding? Possibly to do with uh, the, the equity side of things that we we supply. So yeah, of course it's it's very easy for an investor to to invest. But yeah, what is their exit? In other words, so where will they actually yeah make a return on their money? And that per perhaps isn't as clear as uh, yeah as it could be. Yeah, th but it, it, it's very much a. Uh, scenario where nobody knows what the exit will will actually be. You know, there are probably designs where where the companies would like to kind of have an exit after two, three, four, five years. Absolutely, but um, who knows whether you know there, there will be a, a buyer at that stage? And this is the this is the the the, the, the risk, I suppose, if you like, about equity found, equity crowdfunding. Um, you know, you you don't know when that actual risk will. You don't know when that sale will be. So it is an imponderable. It is not known. There can be no guarantees given about it. But that's ultimately what uh, what you're investing in. And I think that's what Mark might be talking about. Um, in, if if not, then maybe uh, he can kind of just drop another line and, and and clarify it for me. But I think that's the answer that I'd give anyway for it. You're on mute, uh, Peter. You're on mute there, Peter. Yeah, I, I'll just make the same bad comment that you just get beaten into submission now when you're not on mute, so you always forget to take yourself off. Um, apologies for that, everybody. Just, um, Derek, one thing I wanted to ask you was um, just to talk about a couple of examples maybe where um, Grid Finance has been involved with helping from SMEs. I mean, all of you made the point about, you know, um, the economy and obviously... COVID's provided a number of challenges, a number of opportunities, maybe some things aren't as bad everywhere as everybody first thought. But, you know, every time I, I look um, around uh, the webinar sphere, I, I see even the Irish government, the ERSI, you know, doing webinars on rebooting Ireland. So I wonder, Derek, if you have any examples of that yourself and also, you know, is how do we get a collective effort in that regard um, through crowdfunding service uh, uh, platforms, crowdfunding service platforms, I should say. Yeah, well, look at the, the we ran a very successful campaign uh, last year to really try and get the government behind the SME sector um, because we are acutely aware of just how undercapitalized the SME sector is in this country. Uh, they're not just undercapitalized, but they're also underfinanced. Um, so we were deeply concerned when the crisis hit and we saw large uh, cohorts of the SME sector just closing overnight because we knew that they simply didn't have the capital buffers that big businesses have to withstand that. Um, and unlike bigger businesses, they don't get access to very cheap uh, bank funding or public market funding. Um, so, you know, the SME sector, you know, was, was very challenged last year, uh, partly through our campaign, the government really got behind it and it's helped stabilize it, um, but it, it's still very much in intensive care. So really what we're looking towards now is this sort of transition away from government support and life support uh, and into a more normalized uh, economic environment and what impact that has on, on SME's ability to continue to trade. Um, so there's a lot of open questions uh, around that. Uh, what we've done, you know, we've funded um, our own customers and new customers throughout the pandemic. Um, but in, in the main, and you'll see this with the banks as well as with the non-bank lenders like ourselves, there has been a suppression of demand for debt uh, only because it's very difficult for a business borrower to, in good faith, enter into a new borrowing contract when there's such uncertainty around their cash flows. Um, now, what we do is very... It's very specialized, it's a very flexible form of funding, so um, there aren't fixed repayments. But nonetheless, just generally SME business owners are very um, are, are very nervous about entering into new debt commitments. Um, 
as we emerge from the crisis, you know, that that transition from government supports will be um, really key and managing it uh, will be really key to the success of the SME sector. So in that, there's a big opportunity for the likes of Grid um, and other sort of non-bank or crowd funders uh, to, to support SMEs. Um, but, but, but awareness still remains one of our biggest challenges. You know, a lot of SME business owners will just think that the bank is the only place to get financed. So there's a job of work for us to collectively do to build the awareness that this is a really great way to fund your business that doesn't involve uh, you know, going down to your bank branch and uh, going through all of the hoops that the banks typically uh, require you to do. Oh, sorry, sorry. Thanks for that, uh, Derek. Um, I've a uh, quick question here, actually. Um, someone, uh, Sai Nabra, said, really enjoyed the presentation. Previously, the European CSP regulation was set up as an opt-in regulation. Um, do you think generally platforms would have preferred a more opt-in uh, uh, regulation? Um, so in Ireland, obviously, to another question that's sitting there about the difference between the Irish regs and the European regs. Well, the European reg is an Irish reg because it transposed, it actually takes effect in Ireland. So I think for the person who asked that question, if it's maybe, if maybe it's a piece of confusion between that piece of uh, paper there, the Irish regulate, sorry, the European regulation, which um, is uh, has to take effect in Ireland, has taken effect, and that which is the consultation paper which is going to change the Consumer Protection Code. So just to explain that to that uh, person who asked that question. So guys, leading in from that, um, would it have been better for an opt-in regulation here or is this actually the right thing to create a level playing field? It, it, it's absolutely the right thing to create a level playing field. You know, one of the reasons we uh, campaigned very hard a few years ago for a regulatory regime is to put some boundaries and sort of standard rules in the space so that everybody could know where they stand and, and you know, what we should be working towards and start in terms of standards. So um, the, the space will benefit enormously from having that level playing field. If you had a, a, an opt-in approach, um, it, it would end up being a mixture of the Wild West and, you know, good performing compliance sure. uh, platforms, you know? Yeah, no, sure. Same with you, Chris and Colin. Um, yeah, look, at it. I think it rubber stamps what we're trying to do. You know, that form of regula regulatory approval um, gives everybody a, a degree of, you know, com comfort. And, you know, we still, even to this day, you know, the people that haven't heard about Flinder and we are trying to explain, you know, the benefits of, of crowdfunding and our platform, you know, there is a, you know, there is a degree of uncertainty there. What's it about? You know, is this regulated? Um, you know, can you, you know, how do you compare with a bank? So, I mean, we don't have the budgets like a lot of the banks or incumbent players here in terms of, you know, what they have in terms of marketing and, uh, you know, on the regulation side. But as, as Derek has said there, it, it creates, you know, an et a set of ethics and a set of moral standards across the industry, which, um, you know, we would absolutely welcome. Sure. Yeah, I'd echo that. I mean, it's uh, it really isn't possible to do, have the opt-in system. I mean, people will, you know, there's a, obviously there's an expense as well with regards to, uh, you know, in, uh, putting in the regulation. And uh, if people kind of opt not to do it, then they have an unfair uh, advantage as well. So, no, absolutely, it's the right thing to do. And, uh, you know, uh, and we all, all three of us, it seems, uh, welcome it very strongly. Yeah, that sounds great. And tell me, guys, uh, just across uh, a general question here is, um, in terms of lending, um, uh, are you lending uh, to just incorporated entities or could there, can, can you lend to unincorporated um, bodies such as partnerships and sole traders? Yeah. I suppose for the equity crowdfunding, there's a, that's a, <laughs> I appreciate that's not relevant equity crowdfunding, but um, yeah. Yeah, all of the above, sole traders, partnerships, Unlimited companies, limited companies. It's right. all in scope. Once it's a business activity, what we don't do is obviously personal lending. Okay. Yeah, we're the same, Peter. So we're happy to lend to sole traders, partnerships, uh, incorporated companies. Where the restriction is, is if you have a, a, an institutional funder on the continent, um, obviously, you know, outside the jurisdiction, that's where maybe regulatory issues come into play. But uh, if it is through the marketplace uh, and it is through the retail investment platform, yeah, we don't have any restrictions there. Um, can I ask, can I jump back to that question there? Thank you for that, Colin. Can I jump back to that question, Chris, around um, 
liquidity coming into uh, the platforms, potentially from Irish pension providers is, I mean, you know, I won't go into war stories, but that's something I've discussed with my own uh, 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 trustee. And the answer is that they don't have a problem with it, but they've just told me by the time they get around to agree it, the opportunity I'm looking at will probably be closed. We've had, um, yeah, we've had experiences along those lines, absolutely. But we've also had kind of, uh, you know, people put some money in through their pension, through their, obviously their, their trust has to kind of agree to it and everything um, quite quickly as well. And and they've not missed the boat. And, you know, we, we, we've managed to kind of get the money in from that. So I, I don't know whether it is, it is certain kind of um, uh, trustees that need to kind of have more detail uh, around it than others. Um, but no, it is possible. Uh, we have facilitated it and we'd welcome it and would love more of it to come in but uh, we also understand that there are some that are, are perhaps a little bit more conservative and uh, want to kind of do too much no, 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 there's no such thing as too much i suppose but nevertheless uh, the, the the checking and then of course the oppor opportunity has passed and uh, as you as you said yourself so so the, there is a obviously a timeline that needs to be uh, uh, adhered to as well uh, with regards to the, the funding uh, it has to close at a certain date and if you're in you're in and if you're not then well sorry no you're not and uh, and that's the case so so yeah but no happy to to, to welcome it in and uh, as i say more the merrier you're on mute again, Peter. Sorry, thanks for that, Chris. Um, uh, I don't know, Derek and or Colin, whether you wanted to jump in, uh, jump in on that uh, particular point. Is that um, your experience? Pension funds are okay with this, but my experience may just be unusual. I, I, I think the pension trustee industry obviously has, or the pension trustee world has a very important fiduciary responsibility for pension assets and, and their clients. Um, but we've observed some really uh, distortive behavior that the people who actually own this money ultimately are not getting cooperation from their pension trustee to you know, execute uh, placing funds on platforms like us um, in an expeditious way. So I think there's a lot of um, change needed there in the pension trustee industry to really embrace this space to the benefit of everyone. And in particular, to recognize the fact that the pension trustees are simply trustees. They don't actually own the funds. It's their clients that own the funds. And, and there's a real cultural issue there, I think. Okay, thank you for that. And I guess really this is taken to that point of um, maybe in terms of risk and whether the consumer understands the risk of invest uh, of putting their money at risk in these situations as they are in any other investment. Maybe that's what the trustee is concerned about, to your point about uh, it having the fiduciary role. Colin, um, you, uh, I just wanted to see if you could unpack quickly the, the point about literacy that you raised in your presentation, um, if you wouldn't mind just sort of exploring that a little bit further, please. Yeah, so we, we've gone, uh, I suppose we've, we've undergone some changes uh, in, in management and, and in credit personnel in recent months. And part of that, I suppose, transition was to, to do a deep dive into the platform and, and see you know, what our demographic of, of investor was like. And, you know, we were, we were surprised to a certain extent to see, you know, the broad scale of, of age categories um, and, and the, the various different degrees of, of, of investment uh, amounts on the platform. Obviously, one of the, the key features that, that Flinder provides is, is, is ease of access and, and you know the ability to actually become an investor quite quite easily and, and quite seamlessly once obviously AML and KYC checks are carried out. But you know what we found was that um, you know especially in the last twelve months where SMEs have encountered difficulty, forbearance measures have had to be applied, uh, payment breaks have obviously have to be uh, you know you know you know was actioned for for these borrowers. You know investors who maybe have uh, invested into some of those SMEs. You know, fully don't understand the consequences of you know a three month moratorium on a, a marketplace or a, a crowd funded deal. Um, you know your 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 repayments are actually paused. Um, there's no interest payments during that period, but it is obviously lengthened out uh, at the end of of the term in, in in essence. So you know what we found was there was a, a quite a proportion of um, younger, uh, I suppose maybe um, uh, demographic investors who were possibly you know getting started maybe read about it, put a few hundred euros up and were looking to, to get instant, uh, I suppose, success, instant returns. Um, but all of a sudden, 12 months uh, in, uh, COVID has hit and three, six months uh, moratoriums have been applied to their investments. So, 
you know, we took we, we took a huge deep dive into that. And for us, we've we've evidenced that you know financial literacy in the whole area of crowdfunding, peer to peer, uh, understanding the risks associated with that, the consequences of you know um, not getting a return on your investment, um, is, is something that we 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 want we really want to re-educate these people on. And uh, you know, I think what we found as well, and maybe unlike Chris and Derek, you know, the barrier to entry that we have is fifty euro. Um, so that's something we're probably looking at to probably lift that quite significantly uh, over the next few months because, you know, it's, it's very easy for somebody to throw 60, 80, 100 quid, get involved in ABC Limited. ABC Limited doesn't work out. And, you know, these are the people that maybe don't have the literacy in the uh, investment area. So, so that's something I think you will see and hopefully that we will be promoting over the next few months. Yeah, you need to get that that balance right because the cost of acquisition of the client, the minimum amount they can invest in, all these yeah. rules and regulations, you'll have to demonstrate compliance with. Uh, guys, I'm just going to quickly um, uh, jump into a, a sharing a screen here with us, uh, with you again. Um, now, we did say what we'd be doing today, and I'm just having a look at the audience numbers. The actual same number of people who said they're going to stick around between 2 to 2.30 are still um, participants on this call now. So those folk will uh, end up um, I suggest uh, staying until 2.30. I don't know whether we will go all the way to 2.30. It'll just depend upon um, the level of uh, participants we still have. Um, and I do have a question that's still yet to be asked. Um, in the slide deck, and I'll, I said I'll be putting these up on, 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 the, uh, on the internet, um, there's a number of polls I've got up there. Um, one is around uh, the CBI says that proposals for certain advertising requirements aims to create an environment where uh, investors have clear and consistent information, equivalent level of protection and an understanding of the potential loss. Um, just as I'm doing that, um, I thought what I'd do is I, I might just throw that question out to the remaining uh, folk on, um, uh, in, the, on the, uh, in the audience um, and just launch that poll. And there's a yes or no answer or a no view poll, a no view answer if folk want to complete that. Um, so that's up and running now. But the, the one I'd like to mention is actually um, this one here. I mean, there's more slides in my pack other than this, but this is essentially what the, the consultation paper says. Um, the bank is welcoming the, the comments um, from all those stakeholders that would like to comment on this. Um, the closing date for the submissions uh, is the 13th of July. Um, my personal point is to remember uh, to get the regulation you want, um, you need to engage. So if you don't like what's in the proposals for the marketing uh, requirements, which the central bank is entitled to do as a national competent authority, do, um, uh, uh, do engage on this paper. Um, in fact, there's a number of consultation papers sitting out there right now that I think are relevant to innovative financial services companies. Not everything the central bank puts out, I would think, necessarily is relevant to everybody in financial technology, but that's not my judgment call. But what is, is I do put up some of the more interesting ones that catch my eye on our consultation page, just so fintechs can have a look at that. But um, I've already put a poll out there for question four, which was, which option did you prefer, the shorter version of the warning or the longer version? The shorter version actually won uh, on the poll. But um, the first question here is, um, uh, do you support the proposal to apply national marketing requirements uh, to CSPs as foreseen by the EU crowdfunding regulation? Now, the um, majority of people who have answered the last poll question, I'm going to end the polling and share it, um, will probably say they do support um, the proposals because um, in this poll, uh, they're, they're, um, you, the, the Significantly, 84% of folk are saying that um, the proposals uh, for these advertising requirements, you know, will probably meet the intended aim um, for investors to have clear information. So I'll stop sharing those results for that one there. But what I will put up just while we're discussing it, uh, gents, and look, I'm not actually asking to put you on the spot here from any of these polls or any of these questions. I just think it's useful um, for those that may want to join in on a, on a, um, a paper later in terms of a submission, uh, they may want to comment. So I'm just curious, question one. Uh, we're generally supportive of the proposal to apply national marketing requirements 
albeit, you know, I'm not asking you to comment on the specificities of the paper, but the general, the general proposition. So as I'm looking at that, um, we're getting around about 88% um, um, of participants still online, 92%, it's gonna be close to 100% will we'll agree that those proposals uh, as foreseen by the regulation um, are supported. In relation to, I'll just end that uh, poll now. I'll share that poll result. It's up there. So yes, and uh, a couple of folks with uh, no view. Fair enough as well. The, um, the next poll um, that I would mention is, num is question number two. And do you consider all the proposed advertising requirements for crowdfunding service uh, providers are appropriate to the business model of crowdfunding service providers? And I guess that's a bit of a, not a trick question, but it really depends upon the, the company's model. Um, so I just sort of say there, I'll, I'll put that poll up and I'm just, what, I, what I may reach out to you guys in, um, on the panel is to say like, you know, do you think that some of the proposals may have a greater impact on, you know, a, you know, the debt funding versus equity crowdfunding? Or, you know, if you're not quite there yet in, in the sort of the thinking on the paper, that's fine. But I'm just curious whether you've actually spotted anything that maybe one size won't fit all. I've seen on the in the in the documentation. There's a lot of reference to lending, um, and, and I don't know mm. whether that is it uh, is um, kind of uh, relevant or not. But nevertheless, uh, whether they actually well, no, they they choose their words very very carefully. So they obviously mean lending when they say lending. So uh, so it obviously excludes some elements uh, to the equity side of things. But uh, listen, I think that there's enough protection in there for for both to kind of be. Be kept in check and 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 give the required amount of protection to the investors, which is ultimately what all this is about. So uh, so yeah, I I, I do see some uh, extra steps for, for for the lending side of things, or certain extra wording in there anyway. But um, uh, no, I think it will uh, still be very uh, very robust. Okay, that's fair enough. If anyone else wants to jump in, um, do so. I'm just going to go to the last question, and we're probably very close to wrapping up in, in fairness now. Um, Question three is, uh, do you consider that there should be additional advertising requirements for crowdfunding service providers appropriate to their business model in addition to the ones that are already proposed? So actually, Colin, I'm just sort of curious and, and not going to put you on the spot, but when you mentioned financial literacy and things of that nature, sort of it, it is very interesting the points that you raise um, and as to whether or not folk out there may actually have a look to see whether or not they might propose something that looks slightly different uh, than what's already covered by the um, by uh, the consultation paper. Um, does anything strike anyone out there at the moment about um, you know what you may think may also need to be included, or is it too early? I suppose, Peter, just to come in there. I mean, obviously, the age demographic is one I would flag. Perhaps you know that. Uh, Having regulations around obviously maybe being over 18 uh, would be something to, to implement into the into the regulation. Um, you know, we obviously try and emphasize that, but you know, until it comes into law, um, you know, it could be something to add in terms of an age demographic or a minimum threshold. Um, so that 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 would be something that perhaps I would add. Yep, no, that's fair enough. Um, uh, I think uh, just a quick please. point on that. I you know, I think. Brevity is um, is really important. Uh, you know, you look at a lot of the um, the points that are being were being asked to consult on. It's with traditional media in mind. You know, traditional IMs, paper, uh, newspaper based advertising, which is all fine. But if you're running uh, thumb sized ads in social media, it's very hard to have those types of disclosure. Um, so I think that's going to be tricky. Um, but Suitability is really important. Like we do a suitability test for all of the lenders that land on our platform. Um, it's not really covered explicitly in the regs um, in the way that we do it, um, but suitability is really important. And if you uh, yeah. onboard into most investment firms um, and you're looking to make traditional investments, you have to do a suitability test. And I think that's really important. 
Now, that sounds great, and I appreciate that. I'll just put the last poll question up there, um, which is whether anybody would like us to do a deeper dive into um, – uh, I'm not volunteering you guys to, to do this, but, of course, you're more than welcome to come back for another one. But I think there's a lot of questions for the deep dive, and uh, I, I think I know why after having another read through it over the weekend – uh, in the regulation. So I'll just let that one sit. There's just two quick questions I'd ask, um, lads, uh, if you wouldn't mind. Um, one's from Samantha Sheen. Um, Samantha's been a participant in one of our um, uh, events before. Um, she just asked, are there any lessons that can be learned from the pre-2008 crash era where we had a flurry of regulation to try and deal with the mis-selling and the level of knowledge the average investor on the level of risk they were facing fees, et cetera. And, you know, and can we avoid Groundhog Day scenario again? So pre, you know, after the crash, a lot of reaction was more regulation. A lot of regulation, in my view, didn't necessarily help actually explain things in a fair way to a consumer. Do you think the balance is right at the moment? Well, some regulation coming in is, is a good thing, as we've all echoed uh, yeah, in, the, in the talk that we've uh, each given so far. So I think that that's great for, for our side of things. Um, is it too much? I don't think so at the moment. I think this is quite uh, proportional and I think it's just uh, yeah, just fit, is a good fit for us at the moment, I think, as well. Maybe some more will have to come in at some other stage uh, as more and more players kind of start to, you know, getting into the into the market. But for now, I think that the proposals that are out by the uh, but through the regulation from the directive from the oh sorry the regulation from the EU is is is, is very good. Yeah. Anyone else? You know you won't be able to regulate uh, away misinvestment. You know you, what you all you can do is put sort of reasonable controls and rules in place, but there will always be a very small cohort that will misinvest that you will never be able to avoid. You know. Got you there. Yeah. Okay. That's um. That's great. I think this obviously demand will will obviously determine you know in our space in terms of you know for investors so if, without demand and I suppose if there's regulation on the lending side which there has been for years um, you know that that will obviously drive uh, demand for investors but you know if you look at you know even in the US the bank uh, uh, disintermediation piece pre 2008 you know it was quite high it was about 65 percent it's actually getting closer to 85 90 percent in the US and in in, in the U EU um, it was kind of less than 30 percent uh, pre 2008 whereas now you know the focus is actually on non-banks so you can look at that in two ways is it a case that you know uh, uh, borrowers are looking to move away from incumbent banks or does heavy regulation uh, a focus on doing lending a certain way or is it a case that um, you know they're coming to non-banks because of uh, you know the simplicity which uh, isn't isn't uh, obviously focused on uh, you know being compliant uh, within an inch of their life so I think it's uh, it, you know it, it's hard to gauge but um, yeah look at, as, as, as I think Derek has said um, it'll depend on uh, on what sector it, it is. Uh, no thanks very much for that and then the last slide I'm just going to uh, talk about all these last few slides is that um, obviously there's a change to the code and that's coming about because of the regulation um, have a look at this in the slides, folks can do that themselves, but that is the regulation. And when I had a look through that again over the weekend, just so many more questions hit me about what's the loan, what's the firm commitment basis, and, and all that in the regulation. And no surprise that, um, uh, uh, you know, the majority of people, about 90% on the call still here, which is about the same number of people that identify themselves as working in crowdfunding would like a deeper um, presentation on the regulation. So we'll talk to a few people about that. Probably get a few lawyers, a few other experts in as well to have a discussion on that topic. Um, but gents, I'm actually going to pass to you to see whether you have any final um, last words. Um, but I, I wanted to say thank you for your time. Um, uh, it was great to hear from, from all of you. Um, You've invested time into this event, um, not just for the event itself, but actually leading up to the event. Uh, I was delighted, you know, um, to hear about Project Green. It looks like we got a little bit of a uh, an inside uh, a scoop on that. So congratulations, Colin, when you're rolling that out um, as well. Um, uh, but any any final last words there, lads? No, I I, I just encourage anyone interested in. Investing, you know, get on the grid, as we say, in, in grid um, and, and get started in, in, in a modest way. It's, a, it's going to be a regulated space um, and it's going to be a very exciting time over the next couple of years. 
Um, so just just watch this space, you know. With with regards to uh, with regards to Spark Ditter, obviously, um, we we have actually already in, in, embraced an awful lot of the regulation from from the UK side of things uh, already. So you know, although we are not regulated yet um, and will be soon, but uh, you know, a lot of the elements of protection for the investors are already there and established, and uh, and and we've got many people, you know, very um, happy with the with with the way that uh, you know, the investments have worked through Spark already. So yeah, happy to to. For, to, to welcome them on board too. Perfect. Colin, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, look, I suppose first things first, I'd say, look, at obviously Derek, I know you've been leading the, the, the uh, flying the flag for SME recovery.ie the last 12 months. So that's, you know, watching that from afar has been really interesting. And uh, look, at, I think in a post, in a post COVID world, whenever that is in a few weeks and months, that's going to come extremely important. So I think anyone on the call should really log on to SME recovery.ie, take, take a look at that and uh, try and get behind what Derek and the team are trying to do there. And uh, look at from a Flinder perspective, look at, you know, we've had a, a turbulent 12 months to say the least, but we're very excited about what uh, lies ahead with the opportunity, you know, in the next few weeks and months. And, uh, you know, we're excited about Project Green and we're excited about a, a full relaunch of the Flinder brand as well in, in July. So, uh, yeah, look, at just thanks to everybody for, for, uh, for the opportunity. That, that's perfect. And thanks for calling out SME Recovery. In fact, I'll put something up on the FinTech Island website about that, the slides. If you have any material um, that you want to send through to me that you want to be posted up on the website, um, let me, uh, Colin, Chris, or Derek, please just send that through to me and I'll put it up as separate to the slide, this slide deck here. So folk can just find your material and download that, um, that click quickly. So there's my contact details. All of us here today, um, we are all on LinkedIn. I'm not going to volunteer that everybody uh, on the call is going to accept um, every uh, request they get. But look, once again, just wanted to say thank you to, to Derek for joining us today, uh, Chris and to Colin for your insights, expertise. And for those that want to get in touch about working on a, a, a paper response back to the central bank, please get in contact with me. Although hopefully after today, most folk will be able to form their own views and may send in their own responses. But just to repeat that um, it's important to get your views back into the central bank rather than sitting back in six months from now. And we complain that actually that's not what we wanted to see in the national marketing requirements. So uh, without further ado, uh, give everybody back about uh, seven or eight minutes on their time today from the hour and a half we had set aside. Um, hope it hit all the goals and uh, all the outcomes that uh, you you folk wanted to uh, see you achieve today. So um, without further ado. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.